So I like to move around when I have, uh, when I'm on, on the mic, so. Anyway, my, my story starts um, really early. I was three years old um, when I was molested by my family babysitter. Um, by the age of five, I had found pornography. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of skip over many of the details because there's so many. Um, but that, that, those events together caused a certain aggression that um, I acted out in fighting all the time. Uh, fi growing up fighting my brothers, growing up fighting neighborhood kids. I think by the time I was 10, I had fought every kid in my neighborhood. Um, by the time I was 11, my parents were starting to separate. Um, my father had moved away to work and support us. And my mother um, filed for divorce in that time. So by the time I was 12, um, my father killed himself. And um, me and my brothers were in the house. We, we saw the result of his decision. Um, and at 12, you really don't know what to do with that. And so my um, reaction, response to that was to close up, to bottle everything up and not talk about it. And, um, and that manifested in so many destructive ways. Not having a father to guide me through these next phases of life would be really challenging and facing the reality that he's never coming back. He's never gonna be at my graduation, at my football games, at my, my wedding. He's not gonna meet my children. It all hit me at 16. I quickly jumped into drugs. Um, ended up getting kicked out of school a year later at 17 um, as a junior. Uh, I finished high school as a senior, but knew I was gonna be pretty much going back to my old life. Over the summer, between junior and senior year, I, I was forced to go to church um, and I met Jesus. I had kind of this emotional response to the gospel, but no one was there to really walk with me. Um, no one was there to show me what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus. So in that time, I um, made a decision not to go to college, but to go to the Marine Corps. And I'm gonna fly by that, because that was really blurry. Um, all it did was create in me this monster that I lived out without accountability, um, this, this retrobate life, reprobate life. Um, there was no one to reel me in. I did well in the Marine Corps, don't mistake in the two. I did really well. Um, I ended up uh, getting hand selected to go to Force Recon and went to Afghanistan as a, a reconnaissance communicator. I was a machine gunner for my team um, and for the company commander. So when we got back, I was just warped. My mind was just gone. And I cut off all the relationships that I had. I got out of the Marine Corps and I quickly jumped back into drugs. So I went from being this exalted, like praised sergeant of Marines to being this low life drug user and seller. And so I got into the rave scene, um, started pushing drugs through that. And after two years of being out of the Marine Corps and kind of going to school, um, my life just was so deteriorated and so um, wrecked. And to the point where I was, I was really examining the vanity of my life. And I finally came to the conclusion that this life isn't worth living. And I understood for the first time why my father could come to the point where he was ready to take his life and then ultimately do that. Um, it was in that time that I, I really started to cry out to God. And I remember saying, God, like, if this is my life, I don't want this. And if you don't take it, I'm going to, and I'm serious. And so um, a series of events happened that were kind of phenomenal, supernatural. And I ended up going to church for a series of about two months. And every single Sunday, this pastor, would, it was like he was following me around the city throughout the week and telling the congregation on the weekends what I was doing and making a model, an object model out of my life. And so he would always, at the end of his sermons, invite to receive Christ, and I would always reject. And I finally said, I'm not coming back to this church anymore. I'm just gonna go back to my old life. And I did that I, I, at a party one Saturday even, um, night. I'm getting wasted. I'm getting high and drunk out of my mind. Suddenly I feel like this anxiety, and I, I have to escape. I have to get out of there before something happens. So. I go up the street and there's this guy on the street corner who is just brimstone and fire preaching about the revelation and the coming of the Lord and the Holy Spirit caught a hold of me and he basically said, look, you told me you're going to take your life if I did it. Give me your life and I'll take it. And I, I professed Christ on that street corner. I didn't know what I was doing. I was drunk out of my mind 
Um, but as I started to wander back down the street, I realized like, I'm, I'm completely sober. Did, did that just happen to me? Like, is this real? And I decided, you know what, if I wake up in the morning and I'm like actually drunk and passed out in an alley somewhere, I'm just gonna blow my head off. And I woke up the next morning in my bed, in my right mind, and I decided I'm gonna follow Christ. I'm going to serve the Lord God with all of my life. Whatever that looks like, I have no idea what this means, but I'm gonna commit to that. And so, years later, here I am at Biola University. Never would have imagined getting here. Never would have imagined becoming this Christian that I hated. Um, I, I, I couldn't have imagined this. So, um, I ended up getting back, plugged into church, praying, and God led me here to Biola. Um, I'm a film major at Biola, I'll be a senior next semester, and um, my name is Moses Hooper, and I'm, I was made in the image of God. My name is Callahan, and I'm a philosophy major and a junior here at Biola. I've only been a Christian for a year, and I am a recovering heroin addict. When I was 17 years old, between my junior and senior year of high school, there was a period of my life that my family lost six members in a matter of eight months, some to cancer and two to violent murders. I was regularly gone from school to attend funerals or to drive to Sacramento or Santa Monica to sit with my aunt in the hospital who was dying of cancer. In the midst of this, my parents' divorce had become finalized and my brother and I often suffered the repercussions of their separation despite their efforts. Both my parents were seeing new people. My dad remarried, so I was adjusting to new family dynamics during this grief-dominated period of chaos. At this point, with no constants or consistencies in my life and a struggle to cope with grief, my mental and emotional state had quickly become unmanageable. When I was 18 years old, I began using any numbing or coping tool that I could get my hands on, namely drugs. If you can name it, I probably abused it. When I was 20, I tried heroin for the first time at a Halloween party, and its, um, its warming and numbing effect gripped me for the first time. At first it was fun and it felt good, but soon I wasn't able to go a matter of hours without withdrawals. From that point on, getting more was the priority of every moment of every day at all costs. I truly was a slave to my sin. The lifestyle of my addiction was full of deception. I lied to everyone and I stole from anyone. I stole thousands of dollars between the two of my parents and I faked enrollment through two years of community college. When it became harder to steal from my parents, I began shoplifting to sell or trade what I stole for heroin in order to maintain my high so that I wouldn't have to endure withdrawals. I kept this lifestyle up for two years without my family or my closest best friend knowing. Two days after my 22nd birthday, my mom came into my room and found my drug paraphernalia. Three days later, I was placed into my first rehab. It was a 30-day program in Ventura, and it was non-12-step, so I didn't have to give my life up to any higher power or anything crazy like that. I got acupuncture and massages, and everybody was a somebody. One guy had been at Betty Ford with Lindsay Lohan, and another girl had been on season four of Intervention. I graduated the program and I went into a sober living in Santa Monica. I relapsed after only a month and I was put back into a different rehab that I walked out of after three days. I hitchhiked to my drug dealer's house and I slept on his couch for a week. My mom filed a missing persons report not knowing where I'd gone. I ended up going home on my own and I relapsed one more time before my uncle came and picked me up and brought me to the central coast to live with him until my family knew what to do with me. He found a local recovery home for women in the area that I agreed to try, um, but at this point, we all had little hope or confidence in this working. This program was six months long, and it was faith-based. It was Christian. Going into it, I didn't really know what that meant, but all it really meant that we were required to read our Bibles from 6.30 to 7 a.m. each morning, and were encouraged to get to know God in this time. In my first morning of this, I opened the new Bible I'd been given, and I spoke to God for the first time in a long time. And I said, okay, if you're here, I'm listening. And God, 
being the faithful redeemer that he is. He took that invitation of a broken and a contrite spirit and began his work in me. It was in the many, <clears throat> the many hours of the morning in my Bible that God poured into me and illuminated his word and I understood grace. I knew how ugly my sin was in my addiction and I recognized that I owed God my life as my act of worship for bringing me out of it. I got a sponsor and worked the 12 steps and I gave my life up to Jesus as my higher power. After committing to recovery, I was forced to look at the destruction and wreckage I'd caused both to myself and to the people who love me. The sin in my life was in my face and it was ugly. It was shameful to look at. It was humiliating to confess. I began to make amends with the people I hurt and one has traveled to be in this room today, my mom. God has been faithful to bring reconciliation and forgiveness to many of the relationships I broke in my addiction. Though some are still deeply severed and I must accept that there may never be reconciliation. I applied to Biola while I was in computer lab at my rehab, and I was accepted last April after being out of my program for two months. On August 26, check this out, 2013, I went into my recovery program, and on August 27, 2014, I began school at Biola. <laughs> and what a year it has been. Only months ago, I was asked if I was charismatic, and my answer was, and I quote the text message, I would not say that I'm charismatic or charming or anything particularly pleasant, but some people like me. I don't know if that counts. <laughs> I was kindly informed by my friend what she meant by charismatic, and this is a fairly accurate representation of what my learning experience has been here at Biola, and I've been loving every minute of it. In his sweetness and grace, God has brought me here and brought me some beautiful friends. I will always struggle with addiction as a temptation. Standing up here this morning is not something I wanted to do sober. And I'd be lying if the temptation to numb anxiety with something wasn't a regular thought these past weeks leading up to this. My addiction is real, but God's perfect healing and redemption are also real and greater than addiction. My name is Callahan, and I'm made in the image of God. Wow, wow, these stories, man. <sighs> Hi, I'm Lydia Rankin, and um, I'm gonna share with you a bit of my story. I, ever since I was really little, people have told me, like, Lydia, you're really creative. I, I love to sing, I love to write, I love to dance, I really love to get down. And <laughs> on, on the other side, people have all, ways told me, Lydia, you're really intelligent. I love to, to talk about really deep things and you give me a data set, I'm gonna analyze the statistics out of that, son. I love it, it's good. <laughs> and it's also interesting because people have also told me that, Lydia, you'd probably make a really great leader of some corporation someday because I like to take things and I like to take people and I like to mix them together and, to, and make awesome, it's beautiful. And uh, I've also been told that I would probably make a really awesome housewife one day. No shame in that. Hi, mama, she's, she's beautiful. <laughs> I can cook, clean, I love children, oh my gosh, I cannot wait to the day when there's a baby inside of me, all just wriggling around, it's beautiful stuff. So, I, I have this, and I really I recognize that God's gifted me in a lot of different ways. I, there's a lot of different things I can do, and something that's really interesting to me and, and interesting to a lot of other people is with all these things that I can do and the things I've been gifted with, I struggle daily with depression. This pain really started when I was little. Starting at the age of six, I came face to face with the devil. He wore my brother as a mask and used that interaction, that relationship, to tear away at my innocence. It wasn't until ninth grade that I decided, managed to tear down this mask and, and reveal the devil and I admitted and told my parents that for a period of three years, I was sexually molested by my oldest brother. The day after the big unraveling, I was desperate for help and desperate for love and care, and I went to school and told all my friends what had happened, and just wanting, wanting someone to take care of me, to, to tell me it's okay, but then over the next two weeks, friend after friend dropped out of my life because they could not handle my story. 
the summer after ninth grade, I was thrown into no numerous interviews with police investigators and social workers where I had to relive the details of what my brother had done to me over and over and over again. And by the end of the summer, we found out there wasn't even enough evidence to take him to court. I was frustrated, I was angry, I felt alone, and I was mad at God. From the time I was a little girl, I had been taught that the Lord placed his hand of protection over me, that he had angels watching me, that it was, that life was going to be okay because he loved me, but during the time where my brother did what he did to me, where was God? During the time where I'm here seeking justice for the situation, God, where are you? I was hurt and angry and the depression spiraled and moved and just became something really ugly and I started to cut, I started to scratch at my arms with the hopes that the emotional pain would be taken away by the physical pain. I tried to kill myself three times. The third time I tried to jump off one of the buildings at my high school, I was grabbed back from, by somebody, thank God. The school got involved, they contacted my parents. Parents got involved, I was sent to a hospital in North Ridge where I stayed there on a 72 hour hold and it is there that God really showed up. Not really showed up actually. He had been showing up the whole time but it was, it was during that moment that I just started to realize that he was there. And during the moment where I, I was forced to get help was when I started to realize that God loved me. So fast, flash forward to today, here I am telling my story and I've told my story to a number of different people to, to encourage them and, and, but please do not get me, do not get me wrong, do not be mistaken. I am, although my story has been redeemed and my story is a continuous process of redemption, I am still allowed to suffer. Just last semester, I was diagnosed with OCD and a personality disorder, and I found out that my depression is chronic and I'm going to be dealing with this most likely for the rest of my life. I continuously suffer with suicidal ideation, and it is really hard <laughs> to get up in the mornings. With all of this, some people have asked me, Lydia, why don't you claim victory over your life? Why don't you pray more? Why don't you have more faith? And then as if I did A, B, and C, I would be able to somehow get rid of these things that are inflicting me. But I feel as though these people often forget or maybe have never heard of the founding fathers of our faith. The Bible is filled with stories of godly women and godly men who are pushing through, through suffering. God is using their suffering for his glory. And that is, that is my story. I resonate so much with the words of Paul who tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, starting uh, verse seven through nine, that there was, it's that a thorn, he had a thorn in his flesh and he prayed three times, Lord, take this away. But God did not take it away because one, for Paul not to be conceited, and two, the Lord said, my grace is sufficient it is in your weakness that my power is made manifest. And this is my story. I am constantly reminded through the suffering, through the pain, that with all the things I can do, with all my creativity, with all my intelligence, with all my <laughs> housewife abilities, I cannot save myself. I cannot. My pain, my struggle, is a constant reminder to me of my place as creature and God's place as creator. Every day, every hour, I understand that I cannot get through unless I have God holding on to me. I cannot make it through unless God is holding on to me. There is no room for boasting. Furthermore, God has placed people in my life to show me and point me and remind me that my story is being redeemed, that the chaos is, there is beauty that is coming from the chaos, and I'm so thankful for that. And, but at the same time, please again, please again, do not be mistaken. I'm not saying that because of these understandings, life is somehow easy and life is beautiful and perfect. I'm telling you, when <laughs> during those moments where I'm sitting on the floor crying and shaking and begging and praying that the Lord would help me get through the day without cutting myself and without taking my own life, easy is not <laughs> what I'm thinking. Rather, it is during these moments that I have hope because I understand why it is that I'm allowed to go through the things that I'm going through. 
It is because of God's glory. It is for my humility, and as people have pointed out, it is for ministry, which both have their root and their end in the glory of God. I have a story of suffering, but there is no shame in that. God is using it. And at the same time, I will have you know, my name is Lydia Denise Rankin, and I am made in the image of God. All right. Well, you know what? I'd like to emphasize five words as we tie this all up before we sing one last song together. The first word is process. You know what? Moses, Callahan, and Lydia had six minutes to share. It's really hard to grab the idea of process in six minutes. But you know what? If you were to talk to them, they can tell you for hours about what it was like, the ups, the downs, the journey of what it was for them to walk through redemption. The Christian walk is not about arrival. It's about arriving. It's not only about the destination. It's definitely about the, de about the journey there. The second word is long-suffering. This is an old word that reminds us that healing comes with suffering much, that freedom comes with suffering long. Our, free our brokenness is so intimately tied to our family histories and cultural traditions that it would make sense that we would have to long suffer to find resolution. Too many times we think that one prayer or one Bible study will fix our issues. In that 2 Corinthians 12 passage, again, Paul prays over and over and over for the fleshly thorn to be removed, and yet God allows long suffering in Paul's life. If you have an issue in your life that still needs to be worked on, don't be ashamed that it's not fixed after that one really, 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 really meaningful prayer, or after a month of fasting, or even a year of therapy. Our sin is deeper than we'll ever know. But we're in the hands of a God who loves us, holds us, and shapes us more than we'll ever realize. Third word, you. To be honest, I don't personally relate. I don't understand experientially a lot of what Moses, Callahan, and Lydia expressed. I grew up in a pastor's home and in a relatively healthy family and church environment. I have to admit, when I was in, when I was in junior high and I heard these quote-unquote extreme stories, I used to think, oh, I need to go sell drugs or I need to go get someone pregnant and then turn back to God and then have a testimony and then God will love me more. I could tell you guys kind of felt that too, right? You know what, though? I've come to realize that, you know what, God gives us all extreme, that God gives us all unique stories, whether they're extreme or not. As I've, grown, as I've gotten older in the faith, I've come to see that my sin is just as great, if not greater. I've come to see that God loves me and is present in my life just as presently, just as powerfully, just as profoundly as he is in these extreme stories. Everyone's story looks different. The hardest part is to own your own story, to own the story that God gave you, to unpack it and to live it out to the fullest. Fourth word, together. Maybe these image of God testimonies have brought up a lot inside of you today. I wanna remind you that there's a wealth of resources on this campus. This slide up here is gonna show us all the resources that we have. There's a website um, that you can go to that details the different um, resources available on this campus. If you need to talk to someone, please, please, please take advantage of these resources. More than that, I wanna challenge each of you to go share your story or pieces of your story with friends, with roommates, with classmates. Invite them into your process let your story be part of their story, and let their story be part of yours. Lastly, fifthly, freedom. Our God, he makes all things new. Jesus is the hope of the world. Where the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.